You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is December 3rd, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Abbas Chapter 2, Cells and Tissues of the Immune System. Our presenter is Dr. Nikita Raji. She's Chief of the Section of Clinical Immunology in the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. All right. Good morning, everyone, again. Uh, I'm Nikita Raje from Children's Mercy, Kansas City, uh, and we'll be talking about Chapter 2, uh, Cells and tissue, Tissues of the Immune System, uh, from uh, our textbook, Abbas. So let's get started. Uh, I apologize. There might be some background noise here, or if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, please unmute and let me know because I can't see um, the team screen here. So, All right. I don't have any disclosures. The objectives for today are to recognize the structure of various immune cells to understand the function of various immune cells and to identify the differences in the structure of various lymphoid organs. So here's an outline. So we'll go through all the different cells of the immune system and then we'll talk about the different tissues. So here's our pretest, couple of questions and then we'll come back to these at the end. A drug that blocks the function of the chemokine receptor CCR7 would result in which of the following abnormalities? In DeJord syndrome, which I should change the question here, 22Q deletion syndrome, the thymus fails to develop. Which of the following characterizes the immunodeficiency state in this syndrome? All right. So moving along, I'm going to take you back to your medical school information here. Most of the information here, you have seen it somewhere, read it. We are just going to kind of refresh our minds here. So cell counts, I don't need to go over each number. White cells, the normal range is 4,500 to 11,000. Neutrophils are the most abundant, and then come the lymphocytes, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, right? So um, the, the main point I want to make with the, these numbers is some of these numbers are age-dependent, so the normal range can change. So please look at the, uh, always make it a habit to look at the, range for these number, uh, these counts. So let's look at each of these cells and I don't think we come across this information a lot as we move along so I really want you to pay attention. Some of these basics are important uh, as you uh, gain more understanding of the function of these cells. So polymorphonuclear phagocytes as they are called or neutrophils they are named so because they do not stain with uh, HNA &E stain, right? So, uh, and then the polymorphonuclear mentions how they are, it has the lob lobulated nucleus. They are produced in the bone marrow from myeloid precursors under the influence of GCSF, um, GCSF. Uh, 12 to 15 micrometers is their diameter. And as I mentioned, those granules that are called specific granules do not stain with HNA. &E. Um, so these granules have lysozyme, collagenase, elastase that help in the function of these cells. There are also azurophilic granules that have defensins and catalysidins, which have antimicrobial properties. Um, these are short-lived cells, right? So they are present in the blood for a few hours to a few days. And if they do enter the tissue, they'll be there for one to two days because when they are in the tissue, that means that they are needed to fight some of the uh, microbes. Those were our polymorphonuclear. Now we talk about mononuclear phagocytes. So the monocy uh, monocyte derived, so these are macrophages. The phagocytes are macrophages. They are either monocyte derived as we typically think of macrophages. That macrophages come from the monocyte, Bone marrow produces monocytes that go into the blood, and then the, that monocyte goes into the tissue where it's called macrophage um, that helps in um, fighting off microbes. Now, there are also other type of 
uh, macrophages, which are called tissue resident macrophages. And these are the ones that come from fetal life. They were produced in the yolk sac and then um, or the fetal liver, liver and then um, they can take residence in different organs uh, and uh, have been given different names based on which organ we are talking about. So they could be microglial cells in brain or copper cells in liver. Um, so different kinds of macrophages, lungs, heart, they are pretty much everywhere where they take residence and then basically look out for any trouble there. So this graph just shows for each of these organs what is the majority of the source or where the precaution, uh, sorry, precursors of macrophages come from. So initially during embryonic life, all of them come from the yolk sac. Uh, some of them from fetal, some, some of it from fetal liver. And then for some of these organs like brain and epidermis, um, uh, sorry, for brain, the yolk sac derived macrophages continue to stay, uh, to play a big role during adult life. For some of these other organs, um, the ones derived from yolk sac go down in number compared to uh, the ones from the fetal liver. And then also in some of the organs, there are both of those go down over time. And then the bone marrow derived macrophages play the most important role. So for these um, mononuclear phagocytes, we know they come from the bone marrow. Most of the, uh, the most of the uh, macrophages in adult life come from the bone marrow. They are produced under the influence of MCSF. They are 10 to 15 micrometers in diameter with a bean-shaped nucleus, and they have finely granular cytoplasm. They contain lysosomes, they have phagocytic vacuoles, and they have some cytoskeletal filaments. Um, again, as we talked about, they are in the blood, but then they can go into the tissues. So these monocytes, um, are recognized by their uh, surface markers, important one being CD11B. There's also CD86 and MHC class 2 on their surface. So that defines a monocyte. But there are different types of monocytes, and for that we look at some other markers. So classical monocytes, the typical ones that we think of, are CD14 positive, CD16 negative. Both of them are, uh, sorry, these ones are CCR2 positive. So these are the typical monocytes that we talk about. They produce inflammatory uh, mediators and are recruited to the site of injury or infection. Then there are non-classical monocytes, and they are uh, weakly positive for CD14, but strongly positive for CD16, and they also have this chemokine receptor. So they, they are uh, actually important for tissue repair rather than uh, for uh, the inflammation, uh, so they crawl along the endothelial surfaces, which is which has a term called petroling. Um, so they are non-classical; they help in tissue repair rather than inflammation. Classical ones are the ones that are important for inflammation. And then there is an intermediate subset, which means that they are both CD14 strongly positive, but uh, compared to classical monocytes, which are CD16 negative, these are CD16 positive. They also play a role in inflammation. All right, so how are the macrophages activated? There are two different types of activation, um, classical activation and alternative activation. So we talked about their role of these cells in inflammation and uh, tissue repair. So the classical activation is where cytokines are produced um, by T cells, macrophages are activated and they become efficient killers. Uh, whereas if there is alternative type of activation of these macrophages, then the, these macrophages actually help in tissue remodeling and repair. So how do, the, do our healthy host cells, human cells, uh, not get damaged by these macrophages? Um, and why do they not get inflamed from the inflammation caused by macrophages? And that is because of an inhibitory receptor um, on macrophages that plays a role. And, I've, and to me, it's new information. So 
uh, SIRP alpha is the inhibitory receptor on macrophages uh, that recognizes uh, surface marker CD47, which is present on healthy host cells. And as long as that signal is present on the surface, macrophages um, engage that molecule using this inhibitory receptor uh, so that it does not cause inflammation. And it does not, the human, healthy human cell does not get uh, damaged. So I would, I would actually uh, try to memorize this particular signal here. All right, so functions of these macrophages, we know that they release cytokines that help in inflammation. They, they perform phagocytosis, right? They perform phagocytosis of the microbes or also of apoptotic or damaged cells. So that helps in tissue homeostasis, whereas if there is a microbe, they phagocytose and use some of their chemicals, right? Reactive oxygen species and nitric oxide. And then that helps in killing the microbes. They also help in tissue repair by uh, non-classical activation. So we talked about two different types of phagocytes, mononuclear and uh, polynuclear. And so uh, here are the differences. Uh, we know that most of these uh, neutrophils are always produced in bone marrow. Most of the macrophages are also produced in bone marrow. There are some tissue resident macrophages as well that come from yolk sac or liver. Um, neutrophils short-lived, long-lived macrophages, uh, quick response for neutrophils, prolonged and slower response for macrophages, and then the function, right? So both of them are phagocyte, uh, phag phagocytic cells. So they both produce, uh, do their job, but there is a rapid ingestion of microbes with neutrophils versus there is prolonged ability to, uh, for that ingestion for macrophages. Reactive oxygen species more prominent for neutrophils, nitric oxide more prominent for macrophages. Uh, degranulation is prominent for neutrophils, not so much for macrophages, but cytokines are more released by macrophages compared to neutrophils. And then net formation, what's net formation? There is extrusion of nuclear contents in neut from neutrophils, and that has, over last few years has been recognized as one of the important ways of, by which neutrophil provides that um, antimicrobial function uh, along with the reactive oxygen species. That's not present for macrophages. Whereas macrophages undergo something called pyroptosis where they, uh, there is activation of caspase 1 that leads to uh, cell death from inflammation. All right, moving along to another type of cell, mast cells. We know they are produced from bone marrow. The signal that's required for mast cell production is stem cell factor or secret ligand. Um, so we know that the mast cells are recognized by their secret um, uh, gene, and we know the importance of that secret. Uh, if there is a variant, it can cause mast cell disease. Um, so here is the connection. There is mast cells uh, are produced under the effect of secret ligand, um, also known as stem cell factor. So these mast cells have cytoplasmic membrane-bound granules. They are filled with acid proteoglycans that bind basic dyes. Um, so the granules can uh, contain substances that we know are important for their function, like histamine and tryptase. On their surface, they have receptors for IgE. So once they and so they are coated with IgE antibodies. When those IgE antibodies are engaged on the surface, there will be degranulation and release of those contents. Uh, so mast cells are typically present in tissues, skin or muc mucosal epithelium. They are close to the nerve. Uh, uh, vascular and nerve bundle, um, they are not as many in circulation. And so that's the reason we don't see them on our cell counts. When we check cell counts, this is not a typical cell that we will look at. But we look at basophils. So compared to mast cells, these are the ones that also bind basic dyes, but they are more present in the blood rather than tissues. Um, Again, the mediators are similar to mast cells, and they also express and bind Ig receptors 
So, and they can undergo degranulation. Um, but again, mast cells more in the tissues, basophils more in the blood. Eosinophils, now these are the ones that bind acidic dyes, right? The granules in these cells contain basic proteins and then they bind acidic dyes. They are present in the tissues, also some in blood. What's the signal that's needed for production of eosinophils? We all know GMCSF, IL-13, I guess, and IL-5. Um, I'll check on that. Uh, maybe uh, other cytokines also play a role, but IL-5 we know is the, the most important. So uh, basophils um, and eosinophils, again, so you can see the difference, the, uh, the ones that bind basic dyes versus acidic dyes. Another cell is dendritic cell. So again, like macrophages, there are different types of dendritic cells. Dendritic cells, most of them come from the bone marrow and they can be classical dendritic cells, plasma cytoid dendritic cells, or monocyte derived dendritic cells. So the classical dendritic cells are the ones that we think of as antigen presenting cells, right? They are professional antigen presenting cells and what they do is they uh, take up antigens and uh, process them and then present them to uh, the T cells. So there are two types of classical dendritic cells, type 1 and type 2. Type 2 are the ones that we typically think of as the professional APCs that present antigens to CD4. It's easier to remember dendritic cell type 2 going with CD4 just because we know class 2 MHC is on CD4 and they bind to, they interact with dendritic cells type 2 compared to dendritic cell type 1 present antigen to uh, on MHC class 1 to CD8 cells and that's what we call cross presentation and we'll talk more about it in detail but this is something I just wanted to bring up because they are named in a different way. The most prominent ones that we typically are talking about are dendritic cell type 2 and then type 1 is the one responsible for cross presentation. Plasma cytoid dendritic cells. So these are the cells that are important for uh, response to viral infections and they are called factories of um, interferons. So they help in production of cytokines that are really important for defense against viruses. And then monocyte derived dendritic cells also play a similar role uh, with antigen presentation. There are uh, dendritic cells that are produced from uh, yolk sac and, and fetal liver um, and they actually form dendritic cells that are resident to tissues such as in skin they are called Langerhans cells. So what are these Langerhans cells? These are the cells that have uh, uh, Burbex granules. So, um, so we'll talk a bit I think I have a line uh, in the next slide here. So dendritic cells produced from the myeloid precursors under the influence of the signal FLT3 ligand. And uh, as we know, they have those membranous projections for which they are known dendrites, right? Like dendritic cells. And we talked about these different types of dendritic cells. Here are the markers for different types. And so Langerhans cells are the ones that have Langerine or CD207. And they have those granules called Burbeck granules. They are tennis racket shaped and that's what defines them. Um, we just talked about these different types here. Um, CD11C is the marker that's present on the classical dendritic cells. The monocyte derived dendritic cells also have the monocyte marker, which is CD11B on them and CCR2. Both of those are monocyte markers that are also present on these dendritic cells. And again, dendritic cells are really important for, for part of innate immune system, present antigens to T cells and help in, um, help in communication with the adaptive immune system. So what are the other antigen presenting cells? So we know dendritic cells are the most important initial uh, cells that present antigens but macrophages, and once these cells are activated, 
those activated B cells also can present antigens to T cells. So they are APCs. And then if you think about uh, nu all nucleated cells, right, all nucleated cells have class 1 MHC on them and they can present uh, antigens to CD8 T cells. So when we talk about professional APCs, we are talking about dendritic cells, activated B cells, and macrophages. They have um, abundant MHC class 2 on them and that MHC class 2 presents antigens to CD4. When we talk about the nucleated cells, they have class 1 MHC and those present antigens to CD8 T cells. Just so that, you know, immunology is fun and we can make, make sure that you, are, you stay confused, there are these follicular dendritic cells they are, that have nothing to do with the dendritic cells that we just talked about. So these are found in lymphoid follicles. So we are talking about secondary lymphoid tissues where these follicular dendritic cells are present. They do not come from bone marrow. They have nothing to do with the dendritic cells that we just talked about. But these are the ones that present antigens to B cells. So in a way, they are similar to the antigen presenting cells that are used for T cells. Instead, the folliculars, remember fol anything to do with follicles, we are talking about B cells. So follicular dendritic cells are the ones that present antigens to B cells. All right, now we move along to lymphocytes. Uh, lymphocytes are produced in bone marrow from lymphoid progenitors. Here are, you know, there are um, millions of lymphocytes in our body. 65% of those are in the lymphoid organs. 15% in mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. 10% in bone marrow, 4% in skin. And guess what? Just 2% of those lymphocytes are in blood, which they still form 25-30% of the blood white cells. But that's just 2% of the overall total lymphocytes in our body. As you know, lymphocytes have diverse antigen-specific receptors on them. And so they, there are clones of those specific antigen receptor-associated lymphocytes. And so they are clonally distributed. Uh, different types, we know there are T cells and B cells. T cells come from bone marrow and mature in thymus. B cells come from bone marrow, named after the bursa of Fabricius in birds. And these are the ones that then mature in the periphery. So the typical T cells and B cells that we know about. So the B cells that we talk about as B cells are follicular B cells. They are the ones that are present um, in the secondary lymphoid tissue in the follicles, and they make different types of antibodies. For T cells, the typical T cells that we talk about are alpha beta T cells, and alpha beta T cells can be T helper cells, cytotoxic T cells, or T regs. Whereas there are also other subtypes of B and T cells that we don't typically are, so we definitely include them in our discussion here, but when we are talking about clinical features and we talk about flow cytometry, we are mostly looking at these major uh, subtypes, right? Uh, so for B cells, there are marginal B cells and B1 B cells. For T cells, apart from the alpha beta T cells, there are gamma delta T cells and NK T cells. So here are the different types here. So CD4, again, we know uh, that they are present more in the lymph node and spleen, but they are also present in the blood. Uh, they are CD3 positive, CD4 positive, but CD8 negative compared to CD8 positive cells. And then they are both alpha beta. What does that mean? They have a receptor called alpha beta uh, that have alpha beta chains on them. And so they are heterodimers, right? They are not beta, beta, or alpha, alpha. They are heterodimers of alpha chain and beta chain. Uh, and then they have, they have um, CD4 have MHC plus 2 um, interaction, whereas um, CD8 has interaction with uh, uh, plus 1 MHC. Regulatory T cells, CD3 positive, CD4 positive, CD25 positive, and FOXP3 positive. And that, those are important markers to remember for reg T, T regs. Uh, NK T cells, they have markers for NK cells, CD56, CD16, and then also CD3 on them. Um, they also have alpha beta TCR on them. Um, 
compared to gamma delta T cells, which have gamma delta TCR on them or T cell receptor on them. And then mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, sorry, lymph uh, invariant T cells or MAI T cells are also alpha beta category. And most of these are CD8 positive. We talked about follicular B cells. These are the ones with diverse specificities found in the follicles of lymphoid uh, organs, whereas there are marginal zone B cells, which have uh, limited specificity and make mostly IgM. So on their surface is IgM and CD27, whereas B1 B cells are also the ones with limited specificity. Uh, and so they also have IgM on their surface compared to follicular B cells, which could have IgM and then they could switch to other ones. All right, so we talked about the different tissues, uh, sorry, different cells. We know that the lymphocytes come from the, uh, the bone marrow and then they have a choice to become T cells or B cells. Uh, this just shows how they go into the thymus and then with mature and the naive T lymphocytes are released from the bone marrow immature B cells. So these are mature T cells that come out of thymus. These are immature B cells that come out of the bone marrow then they, they go to the secondary lymphoid tissues and then the B cells mature in these peripheral lymph, uh, lymphatic organs. Uh, naive T cells, um, so these all these lymphocytes go into the circulation and then they go into the secondary lymphoid organs and they continue to recirculate between these different secondary lymphoid organs and the blood. Now we look at the different phases of the life of these lymphocytes. So they are naive cells, then when they come across the antigen that they are specific for, they get activated. So they are now called activated lymphocyte. And then once they are activated, they proliferate and then differentiate into something called effector lymphocyte. So activation is where they have to undergo a lot of changes. But then once they are ready to fight that infection, they become effector lymphocyte. And so effector lymphocyte for B cells is a plasma cell and for T cells is our effector T lymphocyte, which could be a different subset of helper cell or a CTL cell. And then some of these can become memory lymphocytes, so memory B and memory T lymphocytes. So clinic, I'm going to look at the different markers of these phases, right? Naive lymphocytes, activated or effector lymphocytes, and memory lymphocytes. And we de use these clinically pretty frequently. So I want to make sure that we look at these different markers uh, and hopefully second years can continue to memorize uh, some of the markers. The one that we use pretty frequently is our CD45. So the naive T cells are positive CD45 RA, uh, which is one of the isoforms of CD45 compared to RO isoform that's present on activated effector or memory cells. So apart from that, does anyone know what, what markers are used clinically to recognize naive or memory cells in the lab? So these are CCR7 and CD62L or L-selectin. So they are typically used along with CD45, RA, RO, because they are completely different for, um, they, are, they can recognize, so those are used to recognize a naive T-cell. So it, naive T-cell would have CD3 on it, CD45, RA on it, uh, I'll, um, sorry, CD62L and CCR7 on them. Uh, once it's activated, it does not have as much CCR7 on it and does not have um, uh, CD45 RA on it uh, and low L-selectin. All right, so CD25 is a marker of activation. So of course it is higher in that phase. Um, the other name for CD25 is IL-2 receptor. Um, IL-7 receptor is important for development, so higher initially, and then maybe in the memory. Um, IL-7R is CD127. And then CD44 is also lower in naive and then higher in activated or memory cells. All right, B cells. Again, naive B cells would have IgM, IgD on them, and then once activated, they can, they will frequently have other uh, immunoglobulins on their surface. 
um, let's see. So these are the ones where CD27 is frequently used as the marker for the B cells. So apart from the B cell markers, we would look for CD27 on them to see, look for the memory B cells. Uh, CXCR5 is high in naive uh, B cells, uh, and then it gets, um, it reduces in amount um, on the surface of activated or memory B cells. So naive lymphocytes B or T, these are mature cells, just inexperienced, which means naive lymphocytes are not immature. They are not, they are fully developed lymphocytes. Uh, they die after one to three months if they are not activated by the antigen. What's a cognate antigen? Cognate antigen means that the specific antigen for that particular antigen, uh, that particular lymphocyte, it's uh, that has the receptor for it. So if the cognate antigen is seen, then they survive, otherwise they die. They are, they are small, then inact they are inactive, and then once activated, they grow larger in size. So in their cell cycle, they are in the G0 stage. And once activated, they go to the G1 stage and grow in size. Survival factors, so how do they just, you know, continue to survive because there's no activation? Well, there is weak recognition of self-antigens by all lymphocytes that is not enough for activation, but it's enough for survival. Also, IL-7 is required for survival of T-cells, whereas BAF is the survival factor for B-cells. And we talked about the CD45 RA that's present on naive lymphocytes. So what is RA? CD45 isoform form. It is a separate isoform from RO. Uh, it contains a segment encoded by exon A. So because it has exon A, it's called restricted A. So CD45 RA stands for CD45 restricted A. And that A is an exon that's present in that particular isoform. So DNA makes RNA, RNA makes the protein. Some of that, some of the RNA will have that exon that's present. Some of them, it's going to be excised out. And when it's excised out, that that's the reason that it's called RO. And we, I think we'll come across that in a, in a slide or two. So effector lymphocytes. Once activated, they grow, proliferate, differentiate into effector cells, and they express different surface molecules. So for T helper cells, they express CD40 ligand on their surface, and their CD marker is CD154. Um, typically, you are expected to know CD markers and the other name for the most common uh, surface markers. Uh, I would, cons I would think of CD40 ligand as an important one, so I would try and memorize these uh, CD markers. Um, also, uh, the lympho effector lymphocytes, which, are, which come from CD8 cells, are now called CTLs, and these CTLs ha express cytoplasmic granules in them, which are used in killing, right? Um, they also, once they are activated, they express the uh, surface marker for activation, which is CD25. We just saw the name, other name for this, IL-2 receptor, is called CD25. So that's an activation marker. Infector lymphocytes, as we know, are short-lived and not self-renewing. For B cells, the effector molecule is called plasma cell. They have an eccentric nucleus. They have a chromatin around the nuclear membrane in a cartwheel pattern that helps to recognize these cells. Um, they have endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi complex in the cytoplasm, and they secrete thousands of antibodies per second. Plasma cells de develop in lymphoid organs and sites of infections. They migrate to bone marrow and then live there and secrete these antibodies. Plasma blasts, what are those? These are precursors of long-lived tissue plasma cells, and they are found in blood in low numbers. So here's our plasma cell with eccentric nucleus and that cartwheel pattern. Memory lymphocytes, these are functionally quiescent, and so uh, they are slow cycling, they are in slow cycling state for months to years. Um, and if, if they are memory T cells, they have IL-7 receptors. So again, like naive T cells, they also have IL-7 receptor on them, and they are, have CD45, so the isoform has changed uh, from that A, exon A is spliced out 
so it's called RO. Um, so CD45 RO is a marker for memory T cells. Memory B cells marker CD27 and they can have membrane IgG, E or A on their surface as well. So this is important to know as the baby, once the baby is born and the baby grows, uh, ba uh, the number of naive T cells um, reduce in number and the memory T cells go up in number. So that's an important concept to remember. The percentages help. There are ranges that are available and age appropriate that you should be looking at when comparing your results. Innate lymphoid cells. These are bone marrow derived. They are similar to lymphocytes. Their effector function is also similar to T cells, but they do not have TCR on them. They do not have T cell receptors, so they are not T cells, but they are called ILCs or innate lymphoid cells. They help in the early defense, so they, are kind of, they help with innate immunity. They recognize and eliminate stressed and damaged cells. Um, so different types of ILCs, they are ILC type 1, type 2, type 3, and so based on that, and NK cells are a type of ILCs, ILC type 1. And so they can secrete different kinds of cytokines depending on the type of ILCs. All right, so moving on to lymphoid tissues, we finished talking about cells. Any questions at this point? Okay. Moving along and talking about lymphoid tissues. Um, so we know primary lymphoid organs are bone marrow and thymus, secondary lymphoid organs or peripheral lymphoid organs are lymph nodes, mucosal immune system, spleen, cutaneous lymph immune system and lymphocyte aggregates in other tissues and organs. Let's talk about the bone marrow. All blood cells are generated in bone marrow. At birth, all bones have the bone marrow that generates these blood cells. By puberty, Hematopoiesis occurs only in flat bones, which are these sternum, vertebrae, iliac bones, ribs. Bone also has the red, red marrow that has the sponge-like reticular framework between the long bony trabeculae. And there are spaces in this framework that contain the network of blood-filled sinusoids that are lined by just endothelium. They, they, are, they are sinusoids. They are not blood vessels. They are just big sinusoids, big spaces with discontinuous basement membrane. That's how the, the cells can move along in, the, in this area. Now, outside the bone marrow, uh, there are clusters of precursors of blood cells in various stages of development and mature fat cells. New cells, as they mature, they migrate through the sinusoidal bone marrow and between the endothelial cells and then into the vascular circulation. This is a figure that you've seen n number of times um, I just compare this to uh, our career, right? Our, as we grow, we make choices on, in what we want to become. And similar to that, these cells, when they are produced in uh, the bone marrow as stem cells, they get to become either a myeloid cell or a, my, a lymphoid cell. And then they further have a choice of becoming different types of lymphoid cells or different types of um, myeloid cells. Uh, one important concept to remember here is that there is self-renewal of stem cells. So when a hematopoietic stem cell uh, divides, it produces one of its own, uh, one cell that is a stem cell, and then the other that is uh, one of the progenitors. Now, down here are the signals that are really important to understand. So initially, when the stem cells are produced, they are positive for some specific markers, like stem cell factor, also known as CKIT. And so there are different kinds of markers that are present. And um, initially, they do not need specific growth factors for the growth of these stem cells. They just need the stem cell factor for their growth. But as they move along this um, um, maturation phase and differentiation phase, they start having, they need, start needing uh, lineage specific growth factors for their growth. Uh, also, initially, they have the standard markers, then and then they um, derive lineage specific markers on their surface that define each of these cells. All right, so we talked about the different cytokines that are 
sorry, cytokines that are needed for uh, growth of different cells. Um, so I'm not going to go over that again. I don't have more information, but this is a nice table to look at this um, uh, table and see what cytokine is needed for what kind of cell. Moving along to thymus. So thymus is a, um, it's a bilobed organ. Um, and in our anterior mediastinum, each lobe has multiple lobules. So these are the lobules. Uh, and each, uh, these are divided by fibrous septa in between them. And it, th there is an outer cortex in each lobule and then inner medulla. The cortex has more of the, like T cell, dense T cell collection, whereas the medulla has some uh, lymphocytes, but they also have macrophages and dendritic cells in there. There are some non-lymphoid cells present in thymus. They, if they are in the cortex, they are called cortical epithelial cells, and in medulla, they are called medullary thymic epithelial cells or MTEX. And so these are the ones that present MTEX are the ones that present self antigens to the developing T cells so that they undergo um, their selection process. They also have something called Hassel's corpuscles, which means they are roles of epithelial cells that are present in, these are present in the medulla. And really they are the remnants of degenerating cells in the thymus because there is so much production, now there is so many um, differentiation points where if they don't make it to the next uh, next phase, those cells are going to die. Um, so those are Hassel's corpuscles. So lymphocytes in the thymus are in various stages of maturation. They are called thymocytes. Uh, they are initially, they go from the bone marrow to the thymus into the cortex where they are immature. They undergo some... Um, they develop their TCR, then they undergo uh, positive uh, selection, then they move on to medulla, they mature, undergo negative selection as well, and then um, once they are completely mature, they become naive T cells that exit the thymus and enter the blood circulation. Now we talk about the lymphatic system, right? There are is this whole lymphatic system, which is the second type of plumbing up, apart from the blood circulation. So it starts out as lymphatic capillaries in various tissues. The lymphatic capillaries have overlapping endothelial cells with one way valve and without tight intercellular junctions or basement membrane. So it helps to uh, in pre-uptake of the interstitial fluid. That lymph that goes into the capillaries flows through the lymphatics because of the contraction of the perilymphatic smooth muscles. So think of legs, right, like lower extremities. There are muscles that pump that, uh, pump that uh, fluid through the lymphatics, uh, and they, these lymphatics are arranged in series, so, so they go from one lymph node to another. They converge into larger lymph vessels and then finally converge into the thoracic duct or right lymphatic duct, and then that um, releases two liters of fluid uh, per day into superior vena cava. Lymph node. I think this is one of the most important parts of our of the um, of, of understanding the lympho, uh, lymphoid tissue, or more like the immune system. So lymph nodes are encapsulated, vascularized secondary lymphoid organ. They, let's start that with, let's look at the structure with efferent lymphatics. So efferent lymphatics is, these are lymphatics that are coming from tissue, right? The capillaries become bigger vessels. They become efferent lymphatic vessels that are draining into a lymph node. So they are bringing things like antigens or uh, opsonized, um, antigens that are opsonized on to complement and things like that. So these are the ones that are going to bring, uh, sorry, the efferent lymphatics are the ones where the antigens are going to enter. Once they enter the efferent lymphatics, then they drain into the subcapsular sinus, and then into the, at, uh, at some point, they get to the medullary sinus up here. 
and then all of that drains into the efferent lymphatic vessels. So those are our, um, that's the plumbing of the lymph node apart from the uh, blood circulation that, uh, that is brought in by the artery and the vein. The B cell zone is, as we know, the B cells are in follicles in most of these lymphoid tissues. So the follicles are primary and secondary. These follicles are initially have B cells that are of different types, uh, but as they come across an antigen, they are going to get one, some of the B cells are going to be activated and that clone is going to proliferate a lot and going to form a germinal center. So there is a dark zone in the center that is, that has proliferating B cells, the centroblasts, and then the light zone has centrocytes that have stopped proliferating. So centroblasts are the ones that are proliferating, centrocytes are the ones that have stopped proliferating. So that's our follicle, we'll come back to that. The T cell zone on the other hand is called paracortex. Paracortex, it's organized in cords and we'll talk, look at it in detail as well. So let's look at the B cell zone again. So there are follicular dendritic cells that are present in the follicles and they have mature naive B cells in, the, in these follicles. When the antigen is presented to the B cells by these follicular dendritic cells, some of them get activated. And when they form a something called germinal center, they are called secondary follicle. So here there is selection of B cells with high affinity antibodies and generation of uh, plasma cells and memory cells. Now we talk about the paracortex. So follicle is B cell zone, paracortex is T cell zone. So what is paracortex? It's beneath and central to the follicles. There is a network of fibroblastic reticular cells. Here is the fibroblastic reticular cell that has this FRC conduit. Um, and they form like a tube-like structure called conduit. And these conduits contain extracellular matrix molecules, co collagen fibers in meshwork of fib fibrillin microfibers, surrounded by a basement membrane that's produced by a sleeve of these cells, FRCs. So FRCs are a really important cell for these T cell zones. These conduits extend from the subcapsular sinus to both medullary sinus lymphatic vessel and cortical blood vessel or high endothelial vessels, venules, sorry. All right, so kind of something to remember, T cell zone is called paracortex and lymph node. They have, uh, FRCs or FR and FRCs produce that FRC conduit and then B cells have follicles. B cells are present in follicles. They are formed around follicular dendritic cells. Um, FDCs are in B cells. FRCs is, uh, are in T cell zone. How do the cells know when they come from, from different places, say, uh, say if they come from the blood, how do they know where to go in the lymph node? So that is important to understand that they almost have like a address that's entered into GPS, right? So that they know where to go. And that is provided by these receptors called chemokine receptors. Because they have these kind of GPS and installed in them, they know exactly where, what to look for and where to go. So these chemokine receptors make sure that those cells are attracted to the chemokines and the chemokines are different for different parts of the lymph node. So in the T cell zones, paracortex, the FRCs produce CCL19 and CCL21. These are the chemokines that are going to attract cells that have CCR7 on them. Uh, so naive T cells that have CCR7 on them enter the lymph node through the HUV and then move towards the T cell zone where there is CCL19 and CCL21. Now, dendritic cells enter the lymph nodes through efferent lymphatics, but they also have CCR7 on them. So they also go to T cell zone. And that's important because these are the APCs that are going to present those antigens that they bring with them to the T cells in the T cell zone. And then the, so it, the CCR7 is not a marker that is specific for a cell. It is specific for the place that they are going to. So it's almost like an address that they have. They are the GPS that takes them to specific places. Same for the naive B cells. They express CXCR5 on them, 
the FTCs in the follicle produce CXCL13 chemokine, and that is the chemokine that attracts any cell that expresses CXCR5 on them. So naive B cells uh, express this marker, so they go there. If a T cell that's activated is trying to help B cells, it needs to go to the B cell zone, closer to the B cell zone, it has to express CXCR5 on it. So it just depends on what marker is present on them that decides where that cell will go. So once the antigen is delivered to the lymph node, what happens to it? It is actually sorted by molecular size. So it, it's almost like a post office where the mail is kind of sorted, right? So the antigen is delivered, it's sorted by molecular size. The flow of, of subcapsular sinus uh, does not allow soluble molecules to pass into the cortex. And then the sinus macrophages actually take up some of the microbes and high molecular weight antigens. And then the low molecular weight antigens um, go through the FRC conduits, pass to the resident cortical dendritic cells that take up those and then present those antigens to the T cells. All right, now we talk about the spleen. So we know that the structure of lymphoid, lymphoid tissue, the secondary lymphoid organs, has that B cell zone and T cell zone. So it's similar for spleen, but let's see what that's, how it's arranged. So spleen, as we know, it's a filter of blood, right? That's what it's called. It's highly vascularized organ. It has red pulp and white pulp. Red pulp, and that has, that has the white pulp. So the white pulp is lymphocyte-rich, and the blood, uh, red pulp has blood-filled vascular sinusoids. The blood enters through the splenic artery, and that splenic artery then divides into different branches and forms trabecular arteries and central arterioles. They have, uh, they finally divides into vascular sinusoids. Sinusoids are then lined by macrophages, and they end in the venules that carry blood into splenic vein. Let's look at the white pulp, which is our interest, right? Those are the places where there are densely packed lymphocytes. These white pulp are surrounding the central arterioles and they drain into the marginal sinus. So here is a central arteriole and it has these follicular arterioles, branches of that, that finally drain into the marginal sinus. And around them are the lymphocytes. So there is a T cell zone and B cell zone. So there is this marginal sinus and the zone surrounding marginal sinus has more of the, um, has different cells. So B cells in the margin, marginal zones are different compared to the follicular B cells. And so there are follicles of the B cells that are also present here, different follicles. And then the periarterial, right? The central arterial around surrounding that arterial uh, is the periarterial uh, lymphoid sheath, which has the T cells. So P-A-L-S, PALS. So remember PALS, periarterial lymphoid sheath in spleen is the T cell zone. And again, B cells are in the follicles. So apart from spleen and lymph nodes that we talked about, there is regional immune system for skin and other mucosal tissues. Uh, there is also non-encapsulated lymphoid structure at other places. Um, so those are the different types of tissues of, lymph, uh, of lymphatic system that play an important role in the immune response. So that's where we end our chapter. Here are a couple of post-test post questions. A drug that blocks the function of the chemokine receptor CCR7 would result in which of the following abnormalities? A. A. That's correct. So remember, CCR7 is the is basically a GPS that takes you to the lymph nodes. So the T cells that have CCR7 would go to the specific area in the lymph nodes. Because the CCR7, if it's defective or a drug blocks it, then there is going to be reduced number of T cells in lymph nodes. In 22Q deletion, thymus fails to develop. Which of the following characterizes the immunodeficiency state in this syndrome? C? Yeah, C. 
Okay, deficiency in T lymphocytes and associated defects in cell-mediated immunity. All right, we have five minutes, so I'll let you guys um, um, summarize the chapter. If you guys want to go over different cells, just a few different important points for each cell or tissue. One thing that was uh, kind of like I that I had always kind of struggled with realizing before was that the like your dendritic cells are not the same as other dendritic cells. Like I knew they did different functions um, that they they like activate B cells in the lymph node, but I guess I didn't realize that they were just so, like completely different from like regular dendritic cells that are just like active in antigen presentation. Right, that's it's not a subset of dendritic cells. It's just a different cell. Uh, it's funny how they named it the same. To it just makes it so confusing. But at the same time, it's nice to relate it to oh, dendritic cells. They present antigens to T cells. Follicular dendritic cells make sense. They are in the follicles. They present antigens to B cells. But other than that, you know, helping us remember the function, there's no there's no connection. I can do a, a quick overview of T cells. Um, so they start out in the bone marrow, but then travel to the thymus, and that's where they will mature. Um, and then once they leave the thymus, they're considered mature T cells, um, but they are naive. And the CCR7 um, marker is what helps them navigate their way to um, lymph nodes, and that's where they will be activated by cognate antigen. Um, if it is present there, and then once it's activated, and there's some other markers that we can use to on our labs, the CD45, um, RA is the marker for naive, and then RO for memory, and then I think once it's activated, it loses that CCR7 marker, which allows it to go out into the to periphery, into home, to sites of inflammation. That sounds good. Yeah, that was a good summary. Uh, just FYI, so some of the memory cells that finally then reside in the lymph nodes will gain back that CCR7. So uh, kind of keeping that in mind. Um, but for all practical purposes, when we use it clinically, we use CCR7 as a marker of naive cells. Um. Well, I'll talk about two smaller, similar ones, so mast cells and basophils. Um, so mast cells produced in the bone marrow um, need stem cell factor slash uh, C-kit um, ligand for development, and um, they release things like histamine and tryptase and are primarily present in tissue, um, whereas... The basophils are somewhat similar in that they can make similar mediators to mast cells, um, and uh, but they are primarily in the blood, and they're also produced in the bone marrow. Sounds good, and they both have IgE receptors on them, so yes, yep. and IgE receptors. Yep, sounds good. All right. Um, I can take a, um, a shot at monocytes versus macrophages. Mm -hmm. So uh, my understanding is like um, in the bone marrow, um, so they, they start in the bone marrow, they, the monocytes then um, go into the bloodstream for about three days, and then um, they, um, once they start residing in the tissue, then they're officially called a macrophage. Mm -hmm. um, so they can reside in various different tissues. Um, there's like that great picture of like GI system skin. Um, and then uh, I think another big difference is, um, so there's like two different types of activation. Um, when I, I guess when I think about macrophages being activated, it's more like in the innate way and then... Um, 
I can't even pronounce like eating <laughs> eating one of the uh, an antigen and then or a microbe or something and then releasing cytokines. And I think the other way is having cytokines activate the macrophage instead. Um, and yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the neutrophils uh, use more more reactive oxygen species, whereas macrophage is used more of nitric oxide. Neutrophils produce nets versus macrophages undergo pyroptosis. So there are different processes that they use, but they both are phagocytes and both do a similar job, one short acting and one for a longer duration. So uh, pretty neat system there between the two of them. Sounds good. And I can talk about um, the sort of lymphatic system and lymph nodes <laughs> since you kind of um, pointed that out as one of the more important things. Um, so overall, kind of our lymphatic system, we have all these um, capillaries that allow uptake of the flu surrounding fluid and go towards the lymph nodes with the afferent lymphatics. And so then like within the structure of the lymph node, you have the B cell zones with the follicles and the um, proliferating B cells within them that are the centroblasts. Mm -hmm compared to the centrocytes that are not proliferating anymore. And the T-cell zone um, is composed of that paracortex that are um, kind of below the follicles. And those are um, uh, like situated around the, the FRCs compared to the FDCs for the B-cells. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, those are important concepts, FRCs, FPCs, and how they are important for that B cell and T cell zones of the secondary lymphoid organs. Um, so that's it for today's chapter. Um, thank you everyone for listening. And.